sadly be lost. Please stick with the rules. Please stay at home. One in 10 could be out of work. Sir Patrick Vallance and I began to have these conversations about, we need a vaccine. We're going to need a special group to move at extraordinary speed, and they're going to have to take some real risks. It was obviously going to be difficult to know whether a vaccine was possible. What we would need was people with really deep technical understanding of this. You can talk endlessly about what you think is the right way to do it, we needed to do something, and I just did it. The government has set up a vaccines task force to coordinate the efforts towards a single goal, to accelerate the development of a coronavirus vaccine. Those in the field know that most vaccine projects fail. We needed to act incredibly quickly in order to stop people from dying. Have you done it yet? Have you done it yet? Are you going to get it done by tomorrow? The UK is in a good position, not because we elbowed our way to the front of the queue. We were at the front of the queue to start with. I'm a venture capitalist, so that means I provide risk finance to help turn smart scientific ideas into new drugs. I received a text from Matt Hancock. He asked whether or not I would be willing to step up as chair of a vaccine task force. And my immediate reaction was, no, I'm not qualified. And I think is a classic imposter syndrome that many women face, which is you may be qualified for 95% of what you're being asked to do, but you focus on that 5%. And when I said that to my family, my daughter, she said to me, Mum, I can't believe you say that because you're always saying that to me and saying I just have to uh, go out there and try and do my best. And she said, I can't believe I'm having to say this to you. I then get a text from the Prime Minister asking if I could speak. And what he said to me was, Kate, I want you to stop people from dying. We need vaccines and we need vaccines to protect the UK. And um, my reaction was enormous um, apprehension because this was a monumental challenge. It had never been done. I had to make sure he understood that it might all fail. Finding Kate Bingham was crucial because, I mean, I knew Kate, but the Prime Minister knew her, and actually uh, he was instrumental in getting Kate in. Kate is uh, a force of nature, for one thing, and, and frankly, it needed a leader. Perfect, thank you. Cheers, thanks. Bye. I'm not a vaccine expert, and I wanted to be surrounded by people who I trusted, who I knew were experts. Clive Dix, hugely experienced industry executive. Ian McCubbin stalwart in the advanced manufacturing sector. Steve Bates, CEO of the Bioindustry Association. Divya from the research arm, effectively, of the NHS. Nick Elliott, former bomb disposal engineer from the Army, who then had a distinguished career running commercial projects. Ruth Todd, manufacturing engineer, who spent her life running complex supply chains. Maddie McTurnan, incredibly savvy commercial negotiator. Then there's me, and I've spent 30 years building and developing new drugs and companies for therapeutics to treat patients. I bicycle to work, and at weekends, occasionally, I've gone bog snorkeling. Go! Come on! Yay! Still got the bike. At least 29,000. 427 people in the UK have now lost their lives to this dreadful virus. Every death is a tragedy. It was a Saturday, it was a Saturday morning. She called me and she's like, Divya, you don't know me, I'm, I'm Kate Bingham. We're doing this vaccine task force, we're setting this up and I'm looking for a clinical trials lead and kind of went, are you asking me, are you telling me? <laughs> Kate being Kate, you, you don't really say no, I think. Um, and that was it. She said, well, when can you start? 
I was made the director general and the senior responsible officer. Effectively, it means I'm accountable for the money, the budget, the contracts, the outputs and everything else. So, yeah, the buck stops here in terms of uh, uh, government accountability. I was originally on the vaccine task force, but of course, you know, when Kate arrived, she said, look, we're trimming this down, JB. Do you mind getting off the vaccine task force? I said, my pleasure, actually, off you go. Kate said, Ian, will you help me with the manufacturing stuff? And I said, sure, let's do it. You meet all these people on Zoom, and you're thinking, what are they going to bring to the team? Then Kate Bingham starts the meeting. And within a few seconds, I think you think, wow, here's a force to be reckoned with. And you just realize that this is a star-studded cast. Jonathan was a, a linchpin of the task force, wondering whether or not he was wearing trousers or shorts under the desk. That, that kept us going. I confess to having had um, what one would call mixed business dress at times above and below the desk line. The UK now has the highest number of coronavirus-related deaths in Europe, according to official government figures. In May, there were a lot of companies all saying they were developing vaccine candidates. So we really had to tease out which ones were most promising versus those ones that were aspirational. I'm a scientist, I'm a pharmacologist. My main skill, if you like, is I assess science very carefully and, and I know what needs to be assessed. There's 200 and odd vaccines out there, which should we buy? There's never been a coronavirus vaccine that's successful. Those with experience in the field know that most vaccine projects fail. So the starting point is this is unlikely to work, but it could work and you've got to go for it. People were going along the lines of one in 10 vaccines made it. And so we were thinking we're going to have to have 10 or 12. So we, we set ourselves a criteria. We're only going to look at vaccines that we know will get into the clinic in 2020. So that cut it down quite a lot. So you then scrutinize the science. I'll use an example. So one of our vaccines comes from Novavax. It's a relatively small company, but we like what we saw on paper. So I basically Googled the guy that was the head of R&D, thinking, well, I'm an R&D guy, I can talk to him. And we had a long chat, we got on very well. We tell them all the data we want to see. You've got to judge whether what you see is going to then end up with what you get. It was, well, do you really think they can make it in this time? Do you really think they've got the, the wherewithal, or would they need some help, and what help would they need? The next thing was, the types of vaccines themselves, the whole virus inactivated vaccines, something called the protein subunit adjuvanted vaccines, the messenger RNA vaccines, and the next one along was the adenovirus vectored vaccines. We couldn't say which modality of vaccine would make it through. We'd spread our portfolio across all those different formats, hoping that one or more of them would actually prove to be successful. On the 11th of January, Chinese scientists released the genetic sequence of the virus. Um, I had a conversation with two senior members of my team saying, should we, should we try making a vaccine? And one of them said, oh, no, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be worth the effort. It's not going to be a big thing. And the other one was uh, supportive. And I think we sat on the fence till the 19th of January. And then we started thinking, this is important, but still thinking this is important because we may need a vaccine for China not thinking the rest of the world at that stage. I work on the development of vaccines against pathogens that can cause outbreaks. We decided with my colleagues here in the Genome Institute that we should start making a vaccine against this virus, knowing that if we needed it, we had to start straight away. A new virus that began in China has now infected the world. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. 
Normally, you just do things one step at a time, and that's why it takes 10 to 15 years often to develop a new vaccine. Whereas here, uh, as soon as the first vaccines were made, the animal studies started. And in parallel, my team was working to actually start the first in human studies. The academics here were very, very clear that there were a couple of red lines for them as we took this forward. And one was they didn't, certainly in the initial run of the pandemic, want to be seen to be cashing in on a lot of human suffering. And they wanted to make sure that whoever we partnered with was equally committed to the global mission, not just selling vaccine in America, Europe, and, and developed countries. When I started looking for a partner, that's actually quite a hard set of red lines to sell to companies that have shareholders and whose business it is to make money. I was speaking to John Bell and I heard about the vaccine that they had and that they were looking for a partner. And I spoke to our CEO, Pascal Sora, and within about two weeks of that conversation, we had a collaborative agreement with Oxford and got going on the vaccine with them. At some stage, in wealthy countries, we wanted to be able to commercialize at a reasonable price. We didn't want it to be not-for-profit indefinitely. But we were quite happy to commit to doing it a not-for-profit during the pandemic. And we were also quite happy to make sure that even post-pandemic, in low-income countries, the vaccine would still be done a not-for-profit. So, you know, Pfizer will make more than 20 billion on their vaccine. Uh, Moderna will make a ton of money equally, um, high teens in the billions. When I pushed him on subsequent occasions, I said, Pascal, why did you say that? <laughs> because you, know, you must be getting all kinds of flack. And he said, well, he said, my kids would have killed me if I said I was gonna make a ton of money on this. <laughs> One of my very best friends died of COVID. So it really drove me on. And still, and he still does today. Because if you know someone that dies of it, you suddenly realize, shit, this is what's gonna happen. There's no time to stop. Sorry. He was at our daughter's wedding on New Year's Eve. And the last photo in the album is him looking up at the stars. He was just such a lovely man. <laughs> People should just look at someone that's died, someone they know, and say, we should be fixing this. could see there would be a second wave with pandemics and vaccines. You are chasing the comet's tail and you have to move really fast because um, a vaccine in time averts disease, whereas um, vaccinating the population after the disease has passed will still save lives, but nowhere near as many. There was no way we could conceive of being in a pandemic for years and years and years. So we had to do whatever it took to actually get those vaccines developed, manufactured, and in front of the regulators as soon as we possibly could. That put an immense amount of pressure on all of us. I didn't have a lot of sleep, and nor did my team members have a lot of sleep. But then again, we knew that we were doing something important and we knew we had to act. Kate had energy that was infectious, and I think everybody in the team caught on to it, and it wasn't like oh, have we really got to do this? It was just, let's do it. The Vaccine Task Force team, the core steering group team, met every Monday morning, Wednesday morning, and Friday morning, three times a week from 8 to 9.30. I hated that one and a half hour that we spent, mainly because 8 o'clock is when my two children wake up. Uh, so I've got one toddler um, who wants breastfeeding at that time, 
one who wants breakfast at that time, um, husband who is roaming around the house without a t-shirt on at that time, and I'm literally got my headphones on, trying to breastfeed on one side, feed the other child, and concentrate on those calls and put in my, my effort and energy and also be switched on. You've got to be switched on. We had three key criteria for the task force. The first was to find a successful vaccine for the UK population at the earliest possible opportunity. The second was then to make that available internationally as quickly as we could support that. And the third was if we're going to do all of this, we need to make sure we can do it again and again, and therefore building up that legacy pandemic capability. So time drove everything. When you've got a challenge like this, you know, you couldn't allow the process to dominate the outcome. We ended up getting a ministerial panel together and they would come together collectively and provide an answer to the things we were requesting them to do. And they'd do it at all times. Eight o'clock on a Friday night, we would get them all together. We were asking for some pretty big decisions and making some pretty big bets. The decisions about what to prioritise was not just, is it scientifically valid? It's, can we get any in the UK? and when's it going to arrive. They're not really questions of science, they're really questions of logistics, they're questions of manufacturing. If we're going to do this, let's make some of this stuff before we know whether it's actually going to work. We made commitments of £900 million to manufacturing and scale up and production, which, if the vaccine failed, would all be then um, flushed down the swanee. I went into this eyes wide open, thinking, I would end up coming to do justification interviews or in front of select committees saying, why did you convince the government to spend money on something that was so risky? I'd been through the purchase of Tamiflu by the, the UK government, and that hadn't um, worked out very well. But I knew that the risk of not doing something had to be balanced against the risk of taking a chance. Manufacturing was the single most challenging step because scaling up these biological systems into industrial scale normally takes years and years to do, and we were trying to do that in a matter of months. One of the vaccines that we started looking at quite early was Valneva. Valneva is a French company, but it's actually got its manufacturing facility based in Scotland. And the UK government have funded a very substantial expansion in that factory in Livingston, which will be here long after this pandemic has gone and be available for future pandemics. We also started to work very closely with Novavax and they decided to manufacture this product in a company called Fujifilm in the northeast of England. When you hear Fujifilm, you might be thinking about cameras, but Fujifilm has actually had a long history in the healthcare sector. They were back in 1936 doing the x-rays. So we were challenged with doing this extremely quickly. My staff have been working 24 seven since July of last year, developing and producing this vaccine. So this is an incubator where we start the process. The cells will grow, then I'll transfer them to the larger bioreactors until we get to the 2000 meter scale reactor. That's when we make the spike protein of the coronavirus. After a couple of days, do a few more steps, and that purifies the spike protein. So by the end of the process, we've got bags of essentially pure spike protein. Then they'll be put into vials before being used for vaccination. And it might be going to my friends, my family, my kids even. It's absolutely amazing. People sometimes ask, what's the bottleneck in manufacturing production? And Quite interestingly, one of the bottlenecks is the bottleneck, literally the stopper you put on the, the top of the, the, the glass bottle. They basically start off as an empty vial of a very high quality glass that's washed with purified water, sterilized at above 300 degrees centigrade, that then pass through a, a, a highly purified cabinet into which the liquid is dispensed. I've set up quite a few manufacturing processes in my time. They never happen easily, they never happen quickly. You always you know, have issues with them and it takes time to, to get through those. But you never normally do those in the full glare of publicity of everybody waiting for the output. 
there was a lot of news stories about there's not enough vials in the UK to make the vaccines. There was a mild frustration and also a slightly smug feeling that, no, actually, we've got plenty. There is a world shortage of vials, but Public Health England had seven million vials stockpiled for flu, which we knew we could use. But we also placed additional orders very, very early. I think it was probably April before most of the rest of the world was coming round to this. Oxford was unlucky because it ran its study in the UK and lockdown in the UK was so effective that they lost all the number of cases over the summer. So that lead that they built up was basically gone because they didn't have the infections to be able to show the difference between those people who are being protected with vaccine versus people who had placebo because no one was getting infected. Whereas in the US, the case numbers were surging. So in the way that Pfizer was able to run the study with the BioNTech vaccine, they didn't have that same dip in infections. You can't be sure where the next wave will be and how long it will last. We didn't know whether it would be in the UK or some other country. We managed 19 sites across the UK and then uh, six sites in Brazil and six in South Africa. This is a global pandemic and of course none of us are safe until everybody's safe. But equally, the clear instruction I had from the Prime Minister was he wanted us to secure vaccine as soon as possible to protect the UK. We're a small country compared with European Union, the US, Japan. They would be ordering much bigger numbers of doses than we would be, which is obviously more attractive potentially to companies than we would be as a small buyer. So we really had to make ourselves as attractive as possible so that people would want to negotiate with us. We need to convince the companies that we're working with, the vaccine companies, to come and run the clinical trials in the UK. We need to sell the UK PLC as the place to run clinical trials. The first focus from our perspective was to support recruitment. Companies wanted to run a 10,000 participant study and in one country. And they said, how are you going to recruit my 10,000 people really quickly? What are you going to do to, do to enable that? So that's when the Vaccine Task Force, we set up the NHS Vaccine Research Registry. The NHS Registry is a site that enables you to be added to a database of people willing to be contacted about clinical trials. We said, you know what, we can fund this. Let's fund this piece of work. And we had a new chief digital officer who just started that week from ASDA. He was head of the digital in ASDA. And I said, we need to set up a system. Can we do this? He said, OK, I'll scope it out. And I said, no, 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 there's no scoping. It needs to happen. It needs to happen. The vaccine task force also said, you know what, we're going to do a massive push out, massive communications campaign behind this. There's no point just setting up a registry if no one's going to actually want to volunteer. And we, um, we launched it. Sign up to the NHS COVID-19 vaccine research registry today to be contacted about taking part. So on July the 20th, we had nobody. And now we've got 450,000 people. The first company to use it was the Novavax study. So the Novavax study uh, is the largest, and I'm going to use the jargon because there is no way around it, placebo control, randomized placebo control trial in the UK ever, ever, um, from a vaccine perspective. And we recruited 15,000 people in less than two months. The speed of that is astonishing. The priority from the Vaccine Task Force was to prioritise those vaccines that were most likely to succeed the earliest. Towards the end of July, we announced the BioNTech contract, which I was really pleased about, as well as Valneva. And in August, we then announced deals with Novavax, and we announced deals with GSK and Sanofi, and with Janssen. And our assessment at the time was that the Imperial vaccine was not going to be in the front runners of the different vaccines. 
government was saying, you know, can you make 100 million doses of a vaccine we'd never manufactured before? We were putting stuff in place, plans in place to do that. And then they were saying, oh, we've made contracts with all these pharmaceutical companies. We're not sure we want your vaccine anymore because we see you as, as being you know, more high risk um, and less mature than, than a, a bona fide pharmaceutical company. It was simply that, you know, it just fell slightly behind in the race. And, and that's what happens. And uh, with the cutoff of saying we needed to have things that would be ready for autumn and winter, that meant that that one just sort of didn't, didn't quite make the cut. The second wave threatening to be more deadly than the first, the NHS on the brink, the PM out of options. From Thursday until the start of December, you must stay at home. You may only leave home for specific reasons. I had to begin conversations with my colleagues in the National Health Service to say, we still don't know for certain, but we believe things have pushed on to the point where we really have to plan seriously for giving out these vaccines. And there were lots of questions immediately back from the NHS about, well, when are we going to have to do this? Can't tell you yet that. Can't tell you that. Are we going to have to give this alongside flu vaccines? Possibly. How will the prioritisation between the two work? Can't say for certain yet. So we actually had to plan lots of different scenarios about how these would come and when they would come and also in what volumes they would come. And that was um, really challenging. I remember saying, how many minus 70 freezers have we got? Just go out and buy them. Don't waste any time. Just get on and buy them. I think we might need them. I'm not sure yet, but I don't want to find we've got a perfectly good vaccine that we can't deploy because we haven't got the right freezers. And they're not things you can get from curries. You know, they're a bit more difficult than that. sitting at home and there were, you know, press articles coming left, right and centre. A lot of the, the flack seemed to be politically driven because I was married to a Tory MP and because I was seen to be part of an inner Tory groupie network, uh, which isn't true. There was a lot of criticism of Kate because of who she's married to, who she knows. Accusations of cronyism, lots of criticism about, you know, why she'd been appointed. We couldn't quite understand why our media were doing this at this point when everybody was working their socks off to do something good. She felt it really, really personally and really strongly. And she felt it was, it was potentially politically motivated. I think it was, it was broader than that. I think there was stuff being leaked about her unfairly from a variety of different sources. She's upset the equilibrium in a lot of different places because she's gone about stuff. And when you upset equilibriums, you find that people feel a bit out of sorts because they're, they're not in the room with 50 other people going blah, 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 because she said, we're not doing that anymore. So you can imagine lots of, lots of people who might have been upset, but it's hard to say exactly who. I was quite concerned for Kate because as strong as she is, you know, she was working at home in Wales in a cottage, you know, farmhouse on her own, nobody else around and getting all this abuse. And, you know, you've got to be a pretty strong person to deal with that. My instinct is to actually talk to people and say, this is what I'm doing, this is why I'm doing it. And if they've got interesting comments or challenging comments, 
bring it on. I have no issue of being accountable, responsible, or any aspect of being assessed in, or challenged in what I'm doing. But unfortunately, I'm not able to speak to the press and I'm not able to answer the critics because those answers are given by the government or the press offices, not, not by me. So that I found very difficult. I mean, just think about it. The idea that I would have a personal <laughs> PR bill of £670,000, just to even say it is ridiculous. I mean, it's just so absurd. If only somebody had said right at the beginning, actually, we spent some money on specialist communications advice so that we could launch a national citizen registry, you'd have thought people would say, you know what, that was pretty good use of spending. <laughs> The billion dollar question was whether or not the phase three trials would show that the vaccines actually offered protective immunity versus placebo. There's no doubt throughout this whole pandemic, the date in November when the Pfizer-BioNTech data came out was just fantastic. A vaccine that works against COVID, the best news so far in the war on the virus. Stock markets jump across the world. The whole world of experts had got themselves into a position where they thought, well, if this is, you know, 50 or 60% effective, that's a really good outcome. To see these 90% efficacy numbers coming out in the interim data was like, we just fell off our chairs all of us like, whoa. I got a WhatsApp from Kate literally within seconds of the results coming out. And uh, we were on the phone to each other and uh, she was whelping down the phone. It was quite, quite remarkable two kids and my husband, and we are literally dancing around the dining room table. It was fantastic. You've also thought, OK, others are going to work now as well. To prepare the results is the most gargantuan effort. Half a million pages of data all presented to the Independent Safety Monitoring Committee. And then this was on a Saturday evening, and they invited me then to um, hear the results. They went through the results. Andy Pollard had kept it completely quiet until Sunday, and then he gathered uh, all of us. You could have heard a pin drop, I have to say, even on a Zoom call, you could have heard a pin drop because everybody was just waiting in anticipation and just watching. I was in the kitchen having dinner with my wife, watching MasterChef, I think it was. <laughs> the telephone rang, and it was my head of respiratory and immunology, and he called me and uh, gave me the results. I was really pleased that we had a positive study. You wait all year for a vaccine and then three come along all at once. Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, and now the UK's very own Oxford AstraZeneca. We're going to end up with a decent number of very effective vaccines. It wasn't just a little light at the end of the tunnel. That frankly was a blinding light at the end of the tunnel to say, okay, this is, this is gonna be the way we get, get through this. June Rain at the MHRA really tore up the rule book of how regulators work. So what she did not do was to change the safety standards of any vaccine or drug that's being evaluated by the MHRA, but what she changed was the way in which it was being evaluated. We knew with the rapidly growing pandemic that we needed to act fast. Normally, a process of regulatory approval may take years. All the data from the studies and the tests is brought together in one package, a one-stop shop. In a rolling review, every piece of data is looked at as soon as it's available. Even the clinical trials were done differently. Usually, phase one, phase two, phase three are done sequentially. This time, we allowed for them to be overlapping so that the next phase could begin while the previous one was still ongoing. And that really took time out of the whole process. Often people think there was a trade-off between speed and scientific rigor, and I can be absolutely clear about that. No corners whatever were cut. The proof of the effectiveness of the rolling review is the MHRA was able to approve the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine uh, weeks before any other regulator around the world did so. 800,000 doses of coronavirus vaccine are on their way here after the UK's medicine regulator became the first in the world to approve the Pfizer-BioNTech jab.
That was number one on our three objectives. Get a vaccine to the UK population as quickly as possible. And we've done it in advance of anybody else. It was just super. In the course of you know, less than seven months, we were able to actually have an approved vaccine that was treating people. And not just one person, but thousands and now millions of people. The supply started coming in and we moved into deployment. It was almost a sense of pride. Okay. Uh -huh. well, well done. done. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> the thing that got me was when my mum was vaccinated. My dad died in September and mum's been on her own and she got her vaccine in, I think it was the last week of January, she's 95. That was super exciting. That was the emotional moment for me. What made it really special for me was um, when I started doing the vaccine clinics shortly after Christmas. Very elderly patients coming out of their homes for the first time to get something which they clearly framed could change their lives. Some of them actually were quite tearful um, on receipt of the vaccine because it meant so much to them. And at that moment, you kind of think, well, you know, this has been awful at times, beyond demanding at times in terms of the work, but yeah, it has actually been worth it. Sitting there, young doctor um, giving me the vaccine, it was just, that's exactly why you come into work. I mean, to, to be able to make a difference somewhere in that system. And for me, that's always been the attraction of being involved in science, actually. It's how can you turn that science into something that can benefit society? And that was the you know, literal example as I was being jabbed in the arm. Fantastic. Today, the European Commission's president went public, threatening to stop exports to countries like Britain, where many people have already been vaccinated. The EU has escalated its legal battle with the British-Swedish vaccine maker AstraZeneca and is threatening to prevent vaccines crossing from the EU to the UK. I do understand the frustration, right? People are dying around the world and they haven't got enough vaccine. But the frustration is we set about doing this with the best intentions and I think in the time frame we've done a damn good job doing that despite the fact that we're under-delivering on the doses that we had originally promised when we didn't know very much about the manufacturing and the yields and all the other things. AstraZeneca can't supply at the pace that Europe thought they were going to supply at. I, you know, I haven't read their contract in great detail, but I've done a contract with AstraZeneca, and I know what they put in their contracts. And, and you know, they, they, they would not have committed to an absolute number because they didn't know they could make an absolute number. And, you know, this with best efforts is a standard feature of contracts. When you get slaughtered in the media, literally on a daily basis, for being, in inverted commas, incompetent, it's really, really difficult for those people that are working so hard and trying their best, many of them with family members in Europe, including myself, my mother's in Greece, and there's nothing that I want more than to have lots of vaccine for everyone in Europe so I can go and see my mum. Europe was very, very, very slow to get contracts signed. And it was because they went into a European procurement methodology rather than uh, the kind of thing that the UK did. We'd already done the deal with AstraZeneca as part of the contractual arrangements that sat around the Oxford AstraZeneca deal. And that's, I think, what was great about Kate. She was the first person to do a deal with Pfizer BioNTech. She did it with Novavax, she did it with Janssen, she did it with Moderna. And that's why the UK is in a pretty good position. It's not because we elbowed our way to the front of the queue from the back of the queue. We were at the front of the queue to start with.
sharp scratch. Yeah. I know now that I've had at least one vaccination of the Novavax vaccine, so I'm really pleased about that. What we're doing with all of these vaccination rollouts is the biggest clinical trial that's ever been done. The emergence of a very rare fatal side effect potentially linked to the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has dealt a serious blow to the central weapon in the government's pandemic armory. If you think about the risk of dying from COVID versus the risk of dying from the vaccination, um, one far outweighs the other. But we will constantly be monitoring this through pharmacovigilance and through working with regulators. What I would say is these clots are extremely rare. Would you be happy with your own daughter being vaccinated with, with the AstraZeneca vaccine? Yes. And I asked her that very question, would she be vaccinated knowing what the risks are? And she unequivocally uh, told me, yes, she would. We've got alternatives and we've also got um, new vaccines that can be used for revaccination or booster vaccinations coming into this winter if it turns out that that's what's needed. Every time you talk about a risk and you know, all of life has risks, you must also talk about the benefits and talk about the lives that have been saved by getting on with speed with a vaccination programme that has clearly changed the course of this pandemic in the UK. When I went to get my vaccine, a lady in line was asking the pharmacist, am I going to have the Pfizer vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine? Because I just wanted to check which one was the most effective. To me, that felt like, wow. Now everyone knows what clinical research and the importance of clinical research is. I cannot wait for the next year to see how many people now take part in cancer studies, diabetes studies, asthma studies, because I think this has set a benchmark up for future research, really. For healthcare, this pandemic will be a watershed. You've seen the fundamental usage of testing. I think we'll be testing for cancer in the way that we've been testing for COVID in a couple of years' time. I think this was always going to be the era of biotech innovation. I think we've just sped it up a decade in a year. This has been a really, really tough year. I can see light at the end of the tunnel now, but I can tell you I'm still really deep in the tunnel. The intensity and the pressure and the way some of what we've done has been represented, it's been very difficult. You know, you definitely have to pause and think, has it been worth it? And of course, the answer is yes, because we've made a huge difference to public health and we're saving thousands of lives, but it's been bloody difficult. When you walk into the village and people stop you and thank you. That was amazing. It's like, it wasn't me. <laughs> I was only part of a team. I spoke to a chap yesterday who was a volunteer working in the vaccination centre car park when I did my last shift last night. And um, we were reflecting together on the fact that, you know, he said, well, I want to be able to tell my grandchildren this is what I did. We've had a year of unbelievably intense exploratory science and interventions of one sort or another, but you've got to be pretty cautious about saying we know what's going on, because actually the truth is I don't think we do. We're going to get more pandemics. I don't think there's any doubt about it. There's a lot of pathogens out there and they will occasionally swap species and cause lots of trouble. We will get pandemics which have much higher mortality than the one we just had. And the globe is wholly unprepared for dealing with global health crises of any kind. And yet our pandemic preparedness has nowhere near the resources that get poured into Trident submarines poking around the North Sea with missiles sticking out their back end. We're making new versions of the vaccine to have them ready so that they're there if we need to use them. 
Also thinking about different ways of being able to administer the vaccine in future. We're not in this race just for COVID-19. We're establishing a brand new technology that's there for the future for infectious disease, but also for cancer vaccines. We'll end up with a lot more manufacturing capacity in the UK that can make vaccines. That's a change that will be there forever. Looking back, I now realise what an unusual thing it was when Patrick Vallance suggested we should create the vaccine task force and embed industry specialists into government, because clearly it's been very effective, but it's also been very unusual. I think we can learn from this. Focus on the outcome, not the process. It's the outcome that's important, then make the process fit the outcome, and that's just not normally how government works. We brought the doers together, as opposed to the, the strategizers and the thinkers. There are obvious other big global areas of challenge that need creative, nimble thinking. If you look at all forms of climate change and the challenges we face there, actually that could well be suited to a industry-led vaccine task force equivalent. I'm just looking forward to going for a pint. <laughs> <laughs>